to a hearing. <clears throat> Oh. Okay, we ready? No, I, I just have a little more and I'm done. I <laughs> promise. <laughs> Joe will go. I promise. Uh, in the uh, in the uh, report of the uh, I think it was the brief filed by the DA's office on page 13. Um, oh, this is the board. This is the board. You said. Okay, okay. So, one other thing on the uh, Burger King incident. There was a witness in the police report, a Miss Pires, P A R P I R E S, and she was a witness to what happened at the Burger King. She says that while at the Burger King, uh, she observed at some point in time one of the Brockton guys holding a gun. So that would have been you. No. What she seen, I don't know who she knew. She could have seen me running back to the car. Well, there's no evidence that anybody else ever had a gun, no, other than you and. Uh, from my understanding, there was other testimony, and again, if there was that, again, she could have seen me. If there was other well, there's no dispute. You had a gun at the Burger King. You took it out. She says, "I saw yes. the guy." One of the Brockton guys, you're a Brockton guy, holding a gun. There's no other evidence anybody else was holding a gun. Just a juvenile, if I may, just briefly. That, it, it, that's where, again, going back to the trial when they get into Brockton, New Bedford, there's, there's young people out there. Yeah, I know, and Tim. There was young people Tim, on the other side that had there's some, Tim, some testimony that there was weapons. And I'm not saying they no, didn't have a gun. No. Obviously, he had a gun at Burger King. The only evidence that I see is they had weapons, baseball bats, chains, tire irons. No one ever said anybody else had a gun. Well, I guess what my point was, when we go back into that Brockton guy, New Bedford guy, getting into, um, you know, the Brockton car, New Bedford car, it's, no, it's no, more no. about you know individuals. No, it's, he said no. the guy who had on the black shirt had the gun. No, 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 no. he had a gun there. No. We'll admit that no. he had a gun, and maybe he, it was that. Look at we're at the Burger King. He took the gun out. Agreed. This witness, this uh, Mr. Uh, Mr. Perez, stated that he observed at some point in time one of the Brockton guys holding a gun. Who else would be a Brockton guy holding a gun? Who knows what's a Brockton oh, guy? Stop. And I understand stop. that, stop. Mr. Mr. Jubilee, honestly. I, I, I okay, respectfully, let, me, let me go on. Very respectfully, he did have his there, gun out at Burger King. Yes. Look, there is no doubt in my mind the only guns that have been in this case are the two guns, one by uh, uh, Reese and one by uh, Mr. Coons. Okay? He took the gun out of Burger King. Agreed. This guy is telling the cops he saw a guy with a gun at Burger King. It's him. There's nobody else. Most likely was. Yep. This person was cocking the gun. You were trying to cock the gun. Am I wrong? No, nope, you're correct. Sir. And pointing it at someone. Not at definitely. This. What? Definitely was not. So this guy's lying. If you look at a couple of the statements, there were no, no. There were three reports. No, there were three reports. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. This guy's lying in your opinion. Absolutely not. That's not me who he's referring to that, okay. that pointed at anybody. Because that's not so there's me. another guy in the scene at Burger King that pulls a gun out and he, he it jams and and he's there's some other guy doing that too. No, no, no. Come on, stop. I can't, I stop. Never pointed the gun at anybody. Never pointed the gun at I'm Burger telling King. you what he's saying to the police. That doesn't make it true. It doesn't make it true. That doesn't make it true. I never pointed my gun. There was never testimony that I ever pointed my gun. The unknown person tried to fire the weapon. Mr. Perez believed that it jammed and would not fire. Absolutely. Absolutely. So he's right about the jamming. 
He's right about the gun. But when it comes to pointing it, he's wrong on that. Never pointed at anybody and never tried to fire anybody. That's the first that I've heard of that question. I don't think that, I'm sorry, Mr. That was it testified to. It doesn't matter whether it's testified, Tim. We're not at a trial here. I'm reading from a police report. Uh, I'm reading from a police report that is, I don't know how many pages, but there's a ton of them uh, about this incident. There's like 35 page police report of everybody they interviewed. And it's a state police report. They are taking statements from people. Maybe those people didn't get called. I don't know whether they did and I don't care. I'm reading from that from that police report that the guy says he's at Burger King and he sees a guy with a gun. You've admitted you're at Burger King and you got a gun. He says the unknown person tried to fire the weapon. But Mr. Pierce believed that it jammed and would not fire. You admit your gun jammed. He's right on that, whoever this Pierce guy is, he's right. Right? Once again, I no, would... Sir, sir. Oh. Is he right about the gun you jammed? and a gun in a jam? Yes. Absolutely. Okay. So he saw you cocking the gun, which you were trying to do. I was on my way back to the car. This is it yes or no? He saw you do that. You did it. You admit you did it. So he's not lying about that. Right? You're it's, it's, look. It doesn't matter to me if you pointed the gun at somebody. I don't care about that. I care about if I don't believe you. I, I, and I'm trying to believe you. Point the gun, Mr. Jumaville, at anybody. Did not point the gun at anybody. And you didn't ask any of the witnesses. This unknown person tried to fire the weapon, but Mr. Pierce believed it jammed and would not fire. Mr. Pierce stated at this time. Danny Santos was telling the guy with the gun to shoot a person. You know Danny Santos? I do. Danny Santos, you don't know Mr. Pires? Was telling this uh, guy with the gun to shoot a person who was unknown to him. So you will at least give me that he is talking. I know you don't agree with everything, but he's talking about you. No, nobody told me to shoot anybody. So I'm not, I'm not, I don't whoa, know. Whoa, 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 whoa! I just said, I know you don't believe uh, him on some of these issues, but you were definitely the guy there with a gun that jammed. So he's right on all of that, isn't he? This witness, whoever he was, would you give me that that he observed that? And you're the guy he observes. Yeah. I'm having trouble here. I did when you say the way. Whoa, stop, 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 stop. Just answer the question. Stop. Okay. Listen, when you say I assume so, I don't believe that. You were the only guy that was observed at Burger King with a gun. Right? He's, he's, you don't know him. He probably doesn't know you, but he saw a guy with a gun. That's you. There's no question, is there? You told us earlier you had the gun out. You're trying to cock the gun. He's right on that. It jammed. He's right on that. Whether you pointed it at somebody or not, it doesn't matter to me at this point in time. I want to find a way to vote for you. When you say to me, this guy's right on all this stuff, but he's full of shit on a couple of things, that, that, that's not credible. That's not credible. He's got no axe to grind. 
He wasn't involved in anything, as far as we know. He just saw a guy who doesn't even know who he was. It was you. And you know Danny Santos. He, he evidently knows him, too. Not, and he says Danny was telling you, the guy with the gun, which is you, to shoot somebody, shoot a person who was unknown to him. He said, I, evidently, he said, I, I don't know who he was telling him to shoot, but he said to shoot somebody. Did Danny Santos say that to you? So the guy's wanna, making that up. Well, let's assume he did. You didn't do it anyway. I have no reason to come in here and say that that did not happen. Well, you did. If Santos approached me and said, look, shoot somebody, I would have said that. Look, look, look. You're fighting me on this witness about it could have been someone else. I'm assuming this. Come on. I'm just telling you that that testimony is not correct. I'm not going to admit to something that is absolutely not true. I, my gun jammed. I told you how it happened. No, but at first when I when I read you even what he said in the beginning, you said, oh, that wasn't me. What do you mean? With the gun. You said to me a few minutes ago. He said, Burger King, at some point in time, you saw one of the Brockton guys holding a gun. You go, well, I, I don't know. I don't know whether who's. You're like fighting me on that. You were fighting me on it. Like you, you may, have, may have not been the guy with the gun. So I probably It's, a, it's a 100 percent in my mind certain that this guy saw what he saw. He wouldn't have all these facts right that you agreed with and be wrong on some other facts. And the facts that you're disputing don't mean a damn thing to me, except how you try not to agree with this. Okay, well. Uh, okay, so as I said, you got a wonderful record in, in jail. Uh, I got to, you know, think about what I'm going to do here. And, uh, I've just given my philosophy on, uh, on murder cases. I don't believe, I believe the United States, the state of Massachusetts should be like every major country on earth. If people get found guilty of murder, they do no more than 25 years. I don't believe we should have life sentences. Okay. Uh, I don't believe people, I think people should get paroled at 25 years. We don't do that, but that's my own, my own philosophy. So you've done 30 years. In my view, you shouldn't have done more than 25. Even if you kill them intentionally, you shouldn't do more than 25, in my view. We're the only country that does that, I think, major country. And we lock people up all over the place. There are more people in jail than any country that ever existed on Earth. And, and more than half of them are minority people. And do you know, do you know why that is, why there's so many people in jail? Because the Supreme Court of the United States except for the year 1953 to 1969 when uh, Earl Warren was the chief judge of the court. And you heard of the Miranda decision, Miranda rights. Well, the Warren court did all that stuff. They were very pro-defendant with rights. They did the exclusionary rule that the cops screw up and find evidence they can't use it against you because they violated some certain thing. Only for that period of time, 16 years, did the Supreme Court of the United States ever, ever give rights to defendants. Every court before that and every court up until now has done nothing but chip away at the rights of individuals in this country. So that police now can stop anybody anytime they want because the Supreme Court said that. They said you can stop and frisk anybody if you suspect there's a weapon 
Well, what is that? How many times do we hear, well, I saw a bulge in the pocket, so I searched it. And there's some drugs in the back pocket. It's good evidence. So in Massachusetts, we have a little higher standard because of our court. But the Supreme Court of the United States has taken rights away from every citizen of this country. And not only did they do that, they have made it so hard to challenge the police in a civil suit. It's almost impossible to sue uh, police and get away with it. And there's a case in California, I don't know, 15 years ago, that said, in fact, you cannot, you cannot. They have immunity. Police have immunity. Prosecutors have immunity. Judges have immunity. And when you have immunity, you can do whatever you want. You can't be punished for it. So, to me, we can blame the Supreme Court of the United States for the way the police approach our citizens in this commonwealth and in the United States. So I think that's a travesty of justice, as my colleague would return. Um, but as far as you, I'm going to consider everything. I thank you for your testimony. And uh, uh, my little bit of philosophy may help you as far as something. But that's it. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we'll hear from uh, Councilor DePaulo. My only suggestion, some of these answers, I, I get the sense, too, you're trying to fight some of us. There's no need to. I mean, you don't have to be so combative. It's just my opinion. But Councilor DePaulo. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Mr. Chairman. Good evening, Howard. <laughs> so, I first want to acknowledge that decisions you made caused hurt, right? Yes. And the Santos family continues to suffer. I can't imagine that. I'm really grateful, maybe not as much as you, I'm really grateful to the governor to have made the decision to bring you here before the governor's office. I think Governor Baker showed a lot of courage doing it, right? And I wish it happened more often, but it's been decades. Right, so there's no doubt that past governors, past administrations, politics has been one of the calculations beyond just the merits of the case. So I'm really grateful to the governor uh, uh, to have made this courageous decision. Um, Council Kennedy and I visited you in correctional facilities. We heard your story. We had a chance to ask you questions. And I don't want to speak for my colleague, but for me, you know, I was there because I believe in commutation. I believe they're under use. I believe in rehabilitation. Um, I believe in incentivizing self improvement, right? And so, because I believe in those things, and because of the system we have, where governors are hesitant to take this extraordinary step, the weight of the world is going to be on your shoulders in this situation, right? Your example, what happens if this commutation goes through, if, and then the next steps, right? If this happens and something goes wrong, it's going to be an easy lever for anyone who wants to to say, see, it doesn't work. These politicians are letting people out and it's causing them to happen. I don't want that to happen. I don't think it's going to happen. What am I going to see if, if I check in with you in a year? And I hope I can because this is, this is, this is important. What am I going to see? So Mr. Coon's going to be up. So that's a good question, and thank you for asking it. Um, you're most likely going to see people. So you're going to see. Excuse me, if you want to take off your mask, no problem. Just so they can hear you better. Yeah. You're going to see that I'm either in the process of starting a restorative justice uh, reentry program on the outside mm -hmm. to help prevent transition. Mm -hmm. You're going to see me involved in getting mentors and help foster the community in prison. Beforehand, before guys transition to parole or going home, time is up. Bringing them to the visitor, you know, trying to bridge the gap with families, certain bridges that are burned in the household. and. To us, can you know, come up and see the guys 
and see what the needs are in their household. So I'm going to be dealing with reentry. There's a huge need for reentry in Britain that obviously leads to the receipt of house. They come to the door and they don't have the support. They don't have the circles that they can come to on the street to be able to put restorative justice or work because restorative justice works. You know, so I'm going to try to set up that reentry circle where now men that are out on the street can come and counsel these guys, or at least sit in a circle with them and tell them about well, obviously restorative justice practitioners on the street. But this is the work that I want to do. This is the work that I want. I'm going to be doing positive things. I'm going to be trying to make a difference in the community. Try to you know make our community and. I like that. That's important work. I've worked in restorative justice. I've seen the difference it can make. And I've spoken to people both today and prior who have said that that's the difference that you have made in people's lives. Um, as I said, I'm really grateful to the governor. I think this was a courageous decision on his part. And I agree with the governor. The governor has executive clemency guidelines, which the governor's free to change if he or she chooses. But as they stand, Relative to commutations, uh, the executive clemency guidelines say that the governor views commutation both as an extraordinary remedy and an integral part of the correctional process. I agree. Review of a petition for commutation of sentence is not intended to serve as a review of the proceedings of the trial or appellate courts or of the guilt of the petition. It is intended to serve as a strong motivation for a confined person to utilize available resources for self development and self-improvement and as an incentive for them to become law-abiding citizens. I completely agree with the governor. That's, that's what I'm here for. I'm interested in what has happened since that night. Um, I want there to be hope in our prisons. I'm hoping that you're going to be a model of hope. We've spent a lot of time in our prisons. Are, the, are our prisons a place of hope? Um, now they are. I mean, this is not familiar. It's um because we heard today about uh, things tangential to your case, access to mental health care in our prisons, uh, practices that are perhaps punitive rather than practical, yes. that maybe don't really target the outcomes we're hoping for. Sure. Have you spent time uh, in the whole in the military confinement? I haven't spent time in there, but I have gone. Um, I did some quick math. So today, the latest numbers say that the Commonwealth spends about ninety thousand dollars per year per incarcerated individual. Obviously, it's been lower in the past. So, the round numbers here: thirty years. I chose 70,000 as an average. So that's a little more than $2 million that the Commonwealth has spent, spent to keep you locked up. A year from now, anyone who looks or anyone I talk to after I've checked in with you, are they going to feel that that was a good investment? <laughs> I'm sorry. The two million dollars that would have accumulated over the course of your yeah. incarceration. Why not? Why do you think so? Um, because they could have probably used better public support. Can you ask your question one more time? Uh, I'm I'm perhaps amusing myself here, but he is two two million dollars. You know, if I'm going to believe the average uh, reported numbers about how much the Commonwealth spends to lock people up, it's about $2 million over the course of your incarceration that the Commonwealth has spent essentially to keep you on. We've heard about your progress while incarcerated. We've heard in other contexts today, we've heard about things that might be lacking in our correctional facilities that might reduce the recidivism. That keeps us that money. I'm wondering, as someone who's done great work 
while incarcerated, has mentored folks to get on the right track. When you look at our correctional facilities, as someone who's lived it, where should we be thinking about our resources? Because earlier today, I think it was Councillor Duff pointed out, you know, we talk a lot about caring about mental health, we care about addressing addiction, and I know this is tangential to you, right? But we, we talk about commutations, we talk about, um, but we don't put the money there, but we do put the money there, we don't put it to solve the problems, right? So I'm wondering as someone who's lived it, what kind what where where do you see things where our resources could be pointed that would make the system better that would produce more thomas Kuntz's that would uh reduce recidivism so i think programming investing into more program within the prison system i think prevention is always better to, to catch you know people before they get to prison more programming to the accuracy or to the mission of getting to the prison system. Then the system we can go towards the program focusing on the program. Prisoners have mental health issues. Lock them up repeatedly. That's a much problem. So again, I think again on the beginning side. And while we're in prison, we're programming that's going to help people to be productive citizens. Uh -huh. And then advocate. The entry is so huge. I see a lot of people returning back and forth to prison because they hit the door, even though they may ideally want the change, that they're really people on the other side to welcome them in and help them to transition into effectively. Yeah. So if we want to reduce recidivism, we need to set people up and spend dollars. We should set people up. Um, as I said, we've had a chance to meet. We've sat through today. We've reviewed your parole board hearing. I feel very confident that the governor has moved. Uh, not only am I proud of the governor and his decision, but I think that he chose an individual who exemplifies the self-improvement, self-growth, the, the things that we hope our corrections facilities are creating. I think there's tremendous pressure on you when this goes forward to be that model, right? I, I, from what I've, from meeting you, from talking with you, I believe that you can be that model. Um, and I hope that this is the beginning of a system that is looking at this process as something that is in fact an integral part of the system and something that perhaps should be happening more frequently. I thank you for your time. Thank you, thank you very much, Councilor Eileen Duff. Thank you very much. How are you doing? Do you need anything to eat? Because we, I had them get you some food. Oh, okay. No. So I'm when? Thank you. No, I don't want it to get too cold. No, um, I'm going to ask you some questions. I'm going to try not to rehash your crime too much. Sure. Um, forgive me if I if I do. Sure. I I don't ask trick questions. Um, some of the some of the things we've been asking, like Council Juvenile, it's, it's hard for us to drill down to some of these these facts. Sure. Um, but let's start with this. Why did you turn down the manslaughter plea? Um. Well, in the first. Trial, you know, consulting with my attorney and again, I didn't know the system of the law. And, and unfortunately, I wasn't willing to take responsibility at that time. That was, that's what taking the five to ten years to take So, you know, consulting my attorney and, and him saying, listen, I don't see first or second degree in this. I think that you should take this trial. That's when I. You know, what we're suggesting. Yeah, I know it's a long time ago and you were much younger. And I was in the Marine Corps. Yeah. Well. Why do you think you would deny another trial? Well, I mean, um, 
you had your, all right, so you had your hung jury, then you had yes. your other trial, then you appealed. Oh, okay. Right? I'm sorry. I did, and you might, might, might miss asking you a question. Why do you think you would deny that appeal? Which I asked. All of them. You were denied all your appeals. Uh, yeah, I know. <laughs> I mean, I'm just uh, sort of lumping it in. <laughs> again, I'm not a legal analyst, and I'm not, you mean the legal aspect of what well, I just know. You, you know, not to be cheeky, but you've had 30 years to think about this, right? Yes. And I know you think about it all the time. Why I was in it? Yeah. And, and so I'm sure you've thought about, um, because you wouldn't even be sitting here if you didn't think about it all the time. Sure. You've never gotten yourself into any of these programs. Sure. Um, so have you ever had any, any thoughts about, you know, why, why did they? You, you know, your first trial was, you know, what was the 12th? Most of them voted to acquit and then two were... Yeah. Undecided. I mean, do you have any thought? And you might not. I'm not trying to trick you. Do you, do you have any ideas on this? Um, I was so hopeful on my first appeal, and I really felt that we see, you know, circumstances in my case, and kind of hoping they would do that, and yeah. then they denied me. I really didn't know why why they could do that. I really, kind of didn't understand it. Again. The legal aspects of why they denied yeah. what they wrote, I'm not quite sure. Okay, Jim. Okay, are you before us asking for time served or for second degree murder? As far as I know, second degree. Okay. Okay. And what makes your petition more worthy than other petitions? So I feel like in the 30 years that I've been incarcerated, the fact that I started very early. Not knowing that about this process or even looking at any of I decided to you know, better myself and do the work. And as I said, starting at Walpole in 1992, initially got involved in the torch program, coming up to Norfolk, immediately wanted to see the programming, metropolitan. <coughs> And I just really wanted to make a difference in my life. I wanted to make a difference in my life. You know, my journey, program, education. The work that I've done in second thoughts, I think you heard from some of the men today. And listen, I'm not a one man show. I had a team and, and people that were assisting me. So I'm humbled that I'm the same. You know, I, I have a team. Again, I assisted that team, and I'm glad that men's lives have changed. Uh, they can write back and say, listen, you've changed my life. And I'm on drugs today. And I'm against it. So I think that I've impacted a lot of people by the work that I do. I'm not the same 20-year-old uh, that, you know, pulled the trigger that made some very bad decisions. I'm not that person. Grown, I've matured. Um, I've come to understand my emotional problems and my issues. He, you know, worked on those through healing through Pastor Devine. He spoke about worked on it through restorative justice, victim offender education. It's Pastor Devine talked about. I've done a lot of work in 30 years, and now I can be an asset in society, and I can make the world a safe place. By now taking you know, skills and all that I've learned, now taking it into the community. To help, you know, some of the men that are out there today that may be struggling, that, have, uh, you know, that, that need these reentry circles coming, you know, to help people come in. I just think that in, in 30 years, I've made some exceptional strides. Okay, yeah, because un under the gui guidelines, and uh, Council to Paul was right, every governor, in fact, this governor did change the guidelines when he, when he came into office. Uh, commutations given to someone who is considered worthy of exceptional remedy. That's exactly what the statute says. So I want to go back to the timeline a little bit. Your original application was in 210, denied. Your second was in 214. Second application? August 6, 2014. 2010 was not denied. Either. Oh, you had a hearing, but you were denied the commutation. Yes. That, I'm sorry, that's what I mean. Sure. Yeah. Um, and then you filed for a commutation four years later in 214. Um, and between 214 
And did you have, uh, when, when did they, when was your hearing? I mean, this, this is a tremendous amount of time to have lapsed. We might, this is what I'm drilling down to. Like you were just in limbo. Did you have any time to update your paperwork from 214 to now? Oh, absolutely. I mean, it looks like you sure did. Oh, absolutely. But um, so when did you find out you were going to get, did you get a hearing in 220? October 27, 220. That's what I thought. Okay, so so in 220, you got a hearing. Yes. Yes, you waited six years for that. Yes. And then um, you waited two more years for a decision? No, I got the decision in three months later. So, so you got your hearing in 220. 20, okay. And then you got the decision in from the from the advisory board. From right from the parole board. So for two years, you've been in limbo. A year. Last year. About a year. So in a year, you've been in limbo. It's, that's not as bad as some of the things we hear. Um, but it's pretty bad, in my opinion. I, I you know, I'm, I don't know how much internet or homework you get to do on these things, but I'm not, I'm not a big fan of how this parole board works. Um, and this is part of the reason why we leave people hanging out there. Um, your original trial prosecutor, John, uh, John Moses, clearly had a change of heart. Um, you know, from what was your trial in 1992? Yes. Um, and the DA Quinn was on today, you know, amplifying that a little bit. Um, of, of almost speaking for someone who's no longer with us. Um, how much do you believe that structural racism played in your charge or your prosecution? I mean, this was 1992. Sure. Sure. And, and do you, you understand? I, I know you're a very exceptionally sure. right man, but you know, we, we as a country have have dramatically, and even people on this council, frankly, have dramatically shifted in the last couple of years, where we have literally watched mostly black men be murdered live on television, and then sometimes people get acquitted. You know, it's starting to shift a little bit. But in 1992, no one was having this conversation. I mean, it, we just weren't, and it's you know, it's not the blame game; it's a fact. But have you, you know, you're a black man. You, everything you've described, all your paperwork and everything, you know, your mom moved, came from a really good family. You know, they're always trying to, it's the American dream, trying to give you a better life, trying to get you into a safer neighborhood, trying to do better things. So that's, that's where I'm coming from, you know, going back in time to 1992. So, you're going back to 1991 well, through trial? Well, yeah, because in 1992 is, is, so you were charged way back when the crime committed, was committed or happened, you were charged sure. and then you were prosecuted and, and the trial was 92. Yes. So back then, how much do you think or believe or feel, which are all slightly different words that mean the same thing, um, that structural racism played in this? Well, you know, I look at the two trials, and, you know, reflected a little bit on it. The first trial, I had my Marine Corps dress blues on because I went to trial. And I believe that a woman can look at that. Serving the country and so forth. I think in the second trial, I just went to the suit on the Marine Corps dress. Any person. Yeah, the black guy. I wasn't the same. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. Say it. So, um, I believe that that played a big role. And I kind of think back to Mr. Moses. And even as my lawyer argued the point that, you know, we can have black people, there's a problem. So I feel like a, a defendant is better served. Schools, uh, somebody who can relate. So, I can relate. Were both of your juries all white? 
And again, the difference is the pavement. I, I and you know what, you're absolutely right because we've had, you know, references to, you know, marine family members sure. already, it, which I get. You know, my dad was marine, my uncle was marine. Um, so, but the but having your uniform on, I didn't know that. I I find that absolutely fascinating in the in the uh, history of this case. Um, how much do you think your age and your peer relationships played in your crime? Um, I think it played huge, huge. Because twenty years consequences or going to the hearings, which I should have been working. Having seen two fights, and then I want to go over to another party. I think, you know, 20 years old, it was just youthful. It was just age plays a huge role. Mm -hmm. And as I understand the brain science, that until 24, fully developed. So I can see why that 20 year old. Went into areas where, we, where he shouldn't have been. But again, a young man is dead. He's going to go. Fortunes and happen. Would you connect that that same thing onto peer relationships? I mean, some of the folks you were out with that? Time? Sure, sure. Absolutely. Wanting to be like uh, appeasing others, going places where I normally went and went just because of peer pressure. Yeah. Or, you want to be one of the guys. Yeah. You want to do what Absolutely. the guys are doing. You're home for break. You want to hang out with the guys. Look back over the, the choices that I made for years. Well, no disrespect to any of the fellows here, but you've said two things that are, are, are just seem to be, you know, a common thread in, in our world is that uh, you're a young man out looking for girls. Makes perfect sense. Um, but I don't know why so many fellows have this obsession with guns in, in the power. I really know what you're talking about. Um, I spent a lot of my life living in inner cities. I didn't grow up in the inner city. Well, I, I, I feel like I did grow up in the inner city. That's when I grew up. But I was raised, you know, in a nice little suburb. Um, but yeah, you know, I understand the obsession with meeting the girls. But sure. also, and you also knew the cue when the ladies rolled the window up. Sure. Yeah, something was wrong. Something was up. Something was wrong. Someone was playing. And, and you weren't sure what they were playing, but you knew they were playing. Um, I'm very, very curious how you got the opportunities in the programs inside that most first degree, first degrees never do. How'd you get them? Because I was adamant about uh, pressing the director of pre taking the extra step to make sure that I could get into the program. You know, it's one thing to sign up for a program and then wait on them to call you, but you will be sitting in prison for a long time. Oh, yeah. First of all, don't get this stuff. So I was I was adamant about, you know, campaigning for the program, the work that I do. You self-advocated. Yes. In the work that you do with some of these fellas in, in, in the prison, do you teach them to self-advocate? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Many of them that I even talk to now say, um, you know, they'll tell me they signed up because I'll ask, like, listen, you programming, have you signed up? You know, because you've seen you walking around the yard a little bit too much. Oh, yeah, yeah, I signed up for emotional women. Signed up for uh, jokes. Well, one of, I'm sorry to interject, but one of the problems I hear constantly is you can sign up, but then they don't have the programs. We don't have enough programming. Yes, yeah, so over, over the last few years, that's become an issue. It's people, really really been problematic like we'll we'll give you know we'll give steps someone will come for a for parole and we'll say well you know you're not going to get it this time but we're going to give you well this board doesn't do this but they used to do it we're going to give you an outline of what you have to do to you know step down and everything and you take this program and this program and this program and you know you check kind of like what you did check off the box and you're going to you know one step further but what, what i would hear constantly from the the people in prisons were, they they gave us things we couldn't do. <laughs> sure. Programs didn't exist or not at my facility. And so again, we're setting people up to fail, in my opinion, 
And we're leaving them, I think Council DePaulo touched on it, without hope. Without hope. I agree. To be inside for 30 years as a young man, went in at 24, to have that hope. I don't know that I could do it. Um, so what, what did make you interested in improving yourself? I mean, was it just a, if they knew you were going to be in there, wanted to do something? Or? As a young man, even coming into prison, I wanted to do something with myself. That didn't stop because I got incarcerated. Okay. I believe in a free state of mind, my technical conditions. Again, I wanted to continue in the process even when I came into prison. I wanted the college education. I was going to have to pay you know, to get into college. Three, three, four, 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 GI Bill into the Marine Corps. Mm -hmm. So I knew the importance of education. So that's why I pursued that. And again, as the rest of you know, you see, I know full of programs, but it was hard to get in with the new life. I fought for what I was for what I was doing. And encourage those along the way. Yeah. Um, so how long were you in the Marine Corps? I did six years. Okay. okay. So how old were you when you enlisted? I was 18. 18, and, and then you were in until you were incarcerated? No, I actually committed the crime when I was home on leave. I know that. I just actually finished up the time. Between the first and second. Okay. Yeah. Right, but you were still, because you were, I, I want to get the, I'm trying to get the timeline. That surprised me. I'm trying to get the timeline clear in my head. So you were, you went in at what you said, 18? 85. Went in at 80, so you're 21 when the crime got committed. 20. And then there were four more years yeah. before you actually went to trial and they put you in prison. That's correct. And during those four years, you were a Marine. Yes. And where were you stationed? They stationed me over in South Wayman. Okay. So they had to give me, you know, any supplies. To yeah. Me. So they accommodated. Yes, they did. Um, when, when you first went into the Marine Corps, I'm going to guess you went to Paris Island like everyone does. Did you receive weapon training? Uh, not at Paris Island. Well, for two training. in the Marine Corps, did yeah. you receive weapon training? Absolutely. And what type of weapons did they train you with? Uh, the M16. Mm -hmm. The M16, the law, Infantry, yeah, automatic weapons that you're going out into to combat and you can shoot, sure. right? You weren't really shooting pistols, no, okay. Um, so we were, we were actually, were we at war during part of this time? I mean, and they never offered you an opportunity to serve overseas. The judge never never occurred. It's fascinating to me. Um, okay. Now, I don't want to go in and beat you up the way Juvenile just did, but uh, your actions the night of the crime are a complete contradiction to your Marine training. Do you agree? How did you get an honorable discharge after killing a civilian? Um. As I stated, they allowed me to go to South Weymouth and uh, committed and completed my time in the Marine Corps uh, prior to the second. Mm -hmm. And so, see my just Okay. Um, some of these other questions we've already gone over. You know, again, I. I kind of know why a young man in Brockton would take a gun with him. I actually kind of understand that. The rest of me doesn't get it at all. <laughs> he, you know, it's just like, what? I'm going on a date. Let me bring my gun. Um, you know, but it is what it is. You were a young kid. You had a gun. And for some re for whatever reason, the, the thing, and I think Council Juman will brought up that really, really doesn't make any sense to me, that I, I, I really have a hard time rectifying 
And I'm not going to ask you to try to rectify it again. I'm just stating my opinion right now is why on earth, since you guys are going to, and you said an Eddie Murphy movie, uh, why on earth you were taking a 22 caliber gun to go see an Eddie Murphy movie, which was probably a comedy and probably lighthearted. And you guys probably thought was go see the movie. We'll go to a bar. We'll have a couple of beers and meet some girls and maybe someone gets lucky and then we go home and nice ship back out to Bremerton. Is that we were? Sure. In three days. That's my guess. I could be wrong. Um, these friends that you were with that night, and I, again, apologize because we've been gone over this a lot. Most of these were, Reese was someone that you knew well, you grew up with, you hung out with. The guys, the guys that you were hanging with that night, that you showered up to meet up with, they, you knew them for a long time, they old friends? Um... Well, or acquaintances, because we all have a lot. I know a lot of people. I know a lot of people. And in high school, I knew a lot of people. I didn't have a lot of what I would consider friends. No. I had a lot of acquaintances. She didn't tell you. He's fine. You know? So in, I'm not trying to trick you. I'm just curious. Sure. Um, Kevin and Ann have moved to church together. Mm -hmm. and it's, yeah. yeah, like this guy behind you. He's a friend. Yes. And um James Reese, I met in Ishi and I. So you know, again, just friends that were hanging out and yeah. we seen you when you came home from work. Yeah. You you gave him a call when you came home. They yes. were that kind of guy. So you weren't calling them up from Washington probably saying what's going on. Exactly. But hey, I'm here, let's go out, let's do something. Okay. I'm curious because it seems they had very um Bad judgment. I mean, they essentially brought you to a gang fight, you know. And somebody in that car, maybe Mr. Reese, I don't know, I'm projecting, kind of knew what was going to happen. Oh, some he kind of knew somewhere if he would, he in this in this map of the world of where you could go that night. For some reason, he was packing a very sure. serious weapon. It, you know, your weapon was serious, but that's a weapon. That's a weapon of war that he was packing. Um, so, in my opinion, he took you to, he kind of knew, I'm not saying you knew, he kind of knew he might run into some basically gang activity that night. Awesome. You know, big word. Um, if you were alone, uh, or, or maybe just with, you know, this kid behind you, sorry, young man behind you, do you think you would have acted differently? Oh, without a question. I would have probably left after the first one. Okay, you want to listen to your instinct. Okay, so uh, you brought the gun, you held the gun, shot it on course. The other group was armed with bats and clubs. You've also said something uh, here today that it's a little bit different than, than what I understood, and that doesn't mean I understood it correctly. Sure. Um, I thought the testimony said that the car you were in actually had a clear path of retreat. And, um, and, and you're saying that, and I, I have no reason to not believe you because there's, you know, evidence in this packet, but there was a car that had backed up. So you guys kind of swerved up on the curb, trying to get, trying to get over. You kind of got stuck in a rut for a second. It, it sounds like maybe you, you got a little panicky. Did you, did you kids did you get a little panicky when you were stuck? Were they trying to rev the car and make it go or anything? Yeah, whoever was driving it. Um, I mean, do you remember? He, he floored, all I remember is he floored the car at the same time that I was. Okay. A path opened up, obviously. Yes. Yeah. So that happened pretty quick. No, just in a split second. Okay. Split second. Okay. So the boy that was murdered got shot through the chest, either through the heart or right next to it. Um, and this is again, you know, I just talked to your attorney. I have a really, our time with the ballistics of this. Um, and I, I hope you understand, you, you may have thought you were gonna shoot that gun in the air, but you, you even admitted to us today, you did not shoot that gun in the air. That gun shot into a crowd of people. Did you, did you do it with, you know, with malice and intent? I don't think you did, but you did, but you, Clearly admitted you did, but but you have to understand. I'm hoping you understand, Mr. Poots, 
um, that it seems incredulous to us, you know, that this different version that you've explained it a little bit better because I have really felt that it's been very watered down. Um, and you told, you know, you said you threw away the gun. You didn't throw away the gun, but you kind of kind of hid the gun, even though you didn't know the people and you may not have been comfortable with it, but you kind of knew that was a hot gun. I did. And you kind of were like, you want my gun? I don't know you, I don't want you here. <laughs> am, I, am I, you know, tell me if I'm wrong, because I wasn't there, you were there. But that, that sort of seems to how, I, how I'm reading it. Like I said, Mr. Reese asked me for the gun. I mean, yeah. he was a little more street smart than I was. Yeah. Thinking like that. Yeah. But I gave him the gun reluctantly that night. Did he have, not, this isn't about him, but I'm just curious, because he was street smart. Did he have any ambition to education or anything, or Marine Corps, or police, or anything like that? Do you, re do you remember? Uh, not prior to that. Okay. Yeah. Just going to hang out in the neighborhood. I can see you know, work at wherever he's going to work at. So I'm not sure what he was working at. Yeah. Yeah. No, nothing wrong with that. Not everyone has the opportunities I've had in life to go to college. You know, not everyone has an opportunity to have a, a roof over their head or have a meal or have, uh, is, you know, sorry, keep talking to the officer behind you, but, you know, to have an intact family. These, this is privilege to have these things. I've said many, many times, I sit here as a highly educated, highly privileged white woman. And half of that privilege is the color of my skin. And I know it. I know it. Um, and I don't take it for granted. Um, so it indicates to me your actions that you did know that, that you did something wrong, that you find the gun in his heart. And, um, and we've heard the witness said, you think you hit me and everything. As a Marine, did you know what you did was wrong? Oh, and the, the, the night of? Yeah. Well, what, I knew I had fired my gun, and again, when Kevin said, it's a button. That's what I'm trying to hear. Did you hear anything about, I mean, the, the case? The, there must have been ambulance. It must have been a big. No, we was out of the You, you guys house. bolted. Yeah, we was. Out we bolted. Of the I'm not going to go over. I'm sure you've heard this a million times, and I don't. The family could be watching. I don't want to go over how this kid died. Um, it from the work I've done. Uh, I, I've had a little bit of a different path to get to this council than other people. This appears to me to have been a perfect storm of what is called hot cognition. I don't know if you've ever heard that. It's the accumulation of stress, the height of anxiety in a bad situation. And it happens a lot and it manifests itself in different ways. And it happens a lot to young people young men, young, young women as well. You we don't talk about them as much, but, but the fellas, we know the more the brain science has been done on the men. And so you, you, to me have perfectly described hot cognition for any psychologist to forensic psychologist. Um, that it, it was just really, you said over and over and over again, my gut told me, my instinct told me, almost, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but almost some of your, your training, you know, you wanted to, you, you had a, you, you actually had a plan. You actually had a goal. You actually had some goalposts in your mind that you were shooting for. Um, in all of this, just, the confluence is just amazing. Um, it, it doesn't mean you didn't do it. And it, you know, you, you, you live with that, right? We never live with it. So we have to take into account the man that you are here today. And the self-work that you've done, 
And yet we also have to take into account the immeasurable grief that the victim's family has been through and feels. And if based on that alone, you wouldn't get out. Do you agree? I agree. Okay. How much weight should we put on their opinion? I think we should. Still grieving that he lost his son. That's why we're here today. Yeah. And I agree that that should be the full consideration. The other hand, I also work that Right. That's in my 30 years prison mm -hmm. to trying to make a difference in somebody and another young man's life. Again, I'm trying to make preparations for speaking. I know you can't do the right to get back. I'm trying to do the best that I can do to prevent any situation like this from happening. I think in the totality, everything should yeah, so you so you do agree that in, in their position, you understand how they feel and and they have every right to feel it and you've expressed complete remorse for this and your, your son has has I can't even imagine the complexity of your life. Um, you know, and how how it all plays into it yet forms you to be you're an incredibly strong man. Um, you, you, you've behaved and done some things tonight and today that, uh, to me, just small gestures that are incredibly impressive of, of that self control in that I can't, I, I, I run hot. I don't know how I, I'd have D's all over the place if I was jail. I'd be a hot mess. Um, but you do in my opinion. Yeah. You have met the standard. You've met the standard of the statute. And so our challenge and my challenge is to weigh, you know, that against this, this family. And does that negate it? I don't think, you know, as painful as it is for a family to hear it, you're not asking for absolution. That's not what this is about today. You're asking for an opportunity to be heard for a different charge, and that charge may give you the opportunity for parole. And I do agree with Councilor Juvenville and Councilor DePaulo. I think it is a colossal waste of money to keep most of the people in this country incarcerated that we incarcerate. Why we do it, I don't, I, I unfortunately think I do understand. Um, but we are blessed to live in Massachusetts. And, and people can, you know, make fun of this council, mock this council, but we have the best judges in the country because they come through this council. They're not elected and they don't go through the state senate. It's not perfect, but it's better than most. Um, you know, I do, I do hope that, that I will see you. I'm sorry. I had family issues this summer. I wasn't able to come to see you. Um, I, the last commutation we did, I, I made a point of going to, it was a woman in, to, to visit her. Um, uh, yeah, I'm not going to belabor this any, anymore. I, I will say though, I, I hope. You know, I know this is getting some press and I know people are listening and, and I hope I hope legislators and in people who control the money because we don't are listening because I really believe I told you earlier, I believe in big, great big crazy ideas. And one of the things I really believe that this Commonwealth should look at is a type of civil conservation or correction conservation pool where we are taking either lower level offenders or offenders who have really, really shown that they are turning their lives around and they want to turn their lives around. And instead of paying $90,000 to keep them in jail, let's put them to work. Let's give you a paycheck. Let's get, let's integrate you back into society and help you succeed. So you have hope. 
And when you have hope, you don't read, you don't read Smith. And a big part of that also is one of the fellows was uh, Mr. Um, Harris, I think, spoke about housing. Housing. You know, it's so you know, you need jobs. You can go someplace and get a free meal if you have to, but if you don't have a consistent place to put your head, it, it, it's it's you really we set it up and just was we're so upside down. Um, thank you for um, your handedness. Thank you for the work you've done in prison. Thank you for your apologies to this family. I do not think you committed this crime with malice. Um, I've explained to you that I, you know, some of it sounds incredulous to us and, and you understand why, um, you know, but it is what it is. Uh, you, you've done the work and uh, this is what uh, criminal justice reform is, is when someone has done the work inside and people come in and testify for them, I believe we're obligated to help them make another better choice. So thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. What we're going to do, we're going to have, before I go to Councilor uh, Devaney, we're going to take a five minute break. And I think Lauren, uh, there's some, uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. 10 minutes, 10 minute break. Yeah, 10 minutes. You can't ten minute break. five minutes. <laughs>
Thank you. Um, Thank you. Well, you've had a long day. And um, I just want to refer to it all the place, but I'm just going to recap, okay? <laughs> okay, let me stop the recap. So on, on August 1st, 1987, Bristol Superior Court indicted you, the murder of the crime. See it. Okay. Now, um, on March 26, 1990, Bristol Superior Court they had a trial. It was a mistrial. There were two who would not vote to have it slaughtered. Um, and again, I said it earlier, um, this was a, a racial. Well, this absolutely disparity in terms that they just had. Uh, <laughs> and and uh, the nominee said, I uh, said, this is an example of so I know that, and there was not one black person on the jury. So, so that was, um, so that was mm -hmm. in March 25th, 1999. Ms. Prime, your attorney wanted to dismiss the indictment sure. and to ask had a permit for a retrial, mm -hmm. and it was refused because of insufficient evidence. So five months later, the judge did not take the motion to dismiss, and you appealed it the next day. Correct? Okay. So, um, it went, um, no criminal justice thing. I want to talk about you and the Marines. You were outstanding. I didn't read the entire letter. Yeah. So. You could say a nice more things about you. Yeah. You helped everybody and you did it to oh. jobs and all of that. And, uh, and of course you got uh, you know an honorable discharge. You earned it. Mm -hmm. And um, as I said, my late husband was uh, so anyway, I you know I, I appreciate that. So um anyway, uh, so many people have supported you and stood by you and it's just amazing. And um, so I don't want to retry, but I, I do want to go back. So you you were going to go to the moon. First of all, thank you for all the time you gave me. I, I it had to be two hours and I to know all about you and you mean so much to me. I, I really appreciate it. So you plan to go to the movies that night with your friends. That was initially what was the plan. Um, but it turned out to be a nightmare. When two groups were fighting, um, you attempted to stop it, you were the second car. And you were the pastor. So you put down the window and you, as you said, you shot in the sky. And you are quoted later that you couldn't understand how a single shot was meant to be a warning shot and would strike the Supreme chest. That's a quote. Okay. Now, recently, there were criminals in a department store and they were shooting. And a mother was with her daughter in the dressing room. And in their culture, they have the um, Sweet 15 party, the girls 15. She's trying on a dress for that party. And the bullet through the dressing room and killed her, and she died in the mother's body. So I'm learning that you might shoot this way, but you don't. So I think that was this whole thing was based on that. That to me is a tragic accident. And I believe you didn't know that you did it. And uh, when your friend was arrested, you went with your mother to make sure that he didn't get the blame for what you did. Okay, so took the life of a 20 year old. So you have. 
going through quite a change. Now, the thing is, I don't want to retry the change. But correct me if I'm wrong. Did you lie by saying that you did it done because you were afraid? You know, so nervous? Yeah, the Marine Corps and I'm so scared. Yeah. Did you think that was a good thing to say that it would get you off the hook? What was the look back? You were young. Again, no rhyme or reason. Now, the other thing is, and, and, and I don't believe the other, I believe people lie. And I'm not going to say it publicly, but I love police, but I had a police chief that accused me, and I'm all my life. And people do lie. And we know all of them are good. They killed, killed some black people who were running. So we know that. But um, in private, I'll say about that. But I know people lie. People in high places lie, too. So, um, you know, so I understand that. And I, I don't, I spent two hours with you, and I really got to know you. Because I, I said, I read everything, three or four in the morning, I would and I'd scream. So that when I saw you, I was prepared to know that you told me. And I remember you lit up and said, you read that. <laughs> so um, that's very important to me. Uh, this is your life book so much. And I think of the son was only a month old, you know? And, uh, and having said that, I do want to read, it's just an excerpt that I have from this letter. And uh, he probably was 20. Thomas, were you 20 in October 2013? I'm just guessing. Is that? 2013. Yeah, that, that was good. Math wasn't my best sentiment. <laughs> anyway, this is the excerpt. Giving up is something my father has never done. He has never given up on himself and furthermore has never given up on me. My father takes full accountability for his actions that night, and that is something that resonates deep within me. To witness the remorse my father feels, and to see it channeled into a positive energy, and put into the many organizations and programs he contributes his efforts towards is very powerful thing. My father's resilience and motivation is something that drives me to do Part of my reason I am pursuing my undergraduate degree from Boston University. I know my father was in that same prison, regardless of his circumstances. From behind his combined prison walls, my father has provided me real life example, demonstrating the power of moral character, accountability, positivity, and responsibility. Thank you very much. And he also um, wrote a letter to, uh, in favor of um, legislation uh, in 2019, and they were built to reduce mass incarceration in Massachusetts. And he said, please accept my sincere gratitude for the support and action you have put towards criminal justice reform. I would strongly like to urge you to consider my father, Thomas E. Coombs, as a highly ideal candidate for the legislation five. 51 days after I was born, my father was wrongly convicted of sentence of life without a chance of parole. This was after a prior mistrial on the same page. I am now 27 years old 
and every birthday serves as a reminder of the length of my body's incarceration. Within this folder, you will find a pamphlet that explains my father's case and what death. In divulges district attorney's testimony stated that the evidence in the case, quote, did not support a first degree murder. At a young age, I learned that my father earned inspired me to earn and May 2015, I graduated from Boston and would not have been able to accomplish this without my father's mentor. If my father were released from MCI Norfolk, it would grant him the ability and means to inspire and coach many others in the same way. His accomplishments and excellent behavior since his incarceration 27 years ago served to prove this. On behalf of the children and families of the wrongly convicted, thank you for your commitment to legislation and to end life without parole sentences. <laughs> now, um, uh, you know, to me, again, it's an accidental tragedy. Mm -hmm. The tragedy is cost of life. I think it comes to time. Mm. It comes to and I just hope and pray for you know that boys be a and as I said, I looked for the names of people the judges now and they said they agreed with me. It just wasn't it. but to me and I said it, and you have proved it. You can't go back and live what the might, the might have been. Because there's people that do that. And if you do, you use all your energy out But today, and you just go you've done that. And, and, and no. now, I want to ask you, you had all these programs, thousands of people have benefited from What has been the most rewarding for you out of these decades? What's that? Just mm -hmm. Of whatever that you do. Sort of justice and defendant education group. Something we're really going to chance to make some stuff. That's all I saw. 34 weeks of literally changing. Uh, it, it had to be so discouraging yeah. to be finally convicted. And then saying you had insufficient evidence to have another trial. And every time it would come up, there would be a black person there. And, and I think even going back at that time, it was worse than it was now. So, um, what has kept you positive to pursue for you? How, how, how does it work? Hey, what has kept me positive to pursue freedom? What's kept me positive? Faith. 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 Faith is kept me. For the fact that I have pursued freedom, I guess. But you know, to me, you excel in everything you've done as a Marine, and you're always a Marine. And also, a 3.5 after the purple, we call it. So you have really been such a role model. For um, all inmates, and, and um, especially my son, and, and I'm, I'm just so impressed that his mother's here for you, and he's here, and uh, reams of letters from people, from people in um, 
you know, uh, oh, police officers and uh, people in court and judges, but also everyday people. Um, it was amazing. I, I've never seen anything like it. So um, I'm just so grateful that finally this came through for you and I'll be voting on it. My only that's, that's the only thing. Um, so um, anyway, so will you continue at all in your do that? Sure. This is the work that I'll continue to the community. This is my ministry, I say. And, so that's great. And I see here, you know, this is all about the uh, rest of justice rule. And you're right here. Yeah. And um, and do I respond to the response of the uh, I think it's wonderful. So um I'm not going to keep you anymore. Um, if you have anything, and um, uh, I thank you for all the time that you avoided me. I got lost going home. I never heard of not lost. I lived in Shelton Heights, so anyway. And so, um, in fact, I got lost Something quick. Um, yesterday. So um, I got to get out of <laughs> But I thank you so much for all your patience one day. And so um, please next Thank you. Next we'll hear from I'm sorry. I'm finished. Yeah, just uh, uh February sixteenth is the vote. I'm sorry, what? February sixteenth is the vote that we want. Oh, I'm that's, sorry. No, that's okay. Next we'll hear from next we'll hear from Terrence Kennedy. Maybe we should take like an hour dinner break first because yeah. they have a lot of questions. Yeah. Mr. Kennedy is next. All right. I don't, I'm not going to ask you any questions. Okay. You've had a long day. Um, I, I, Paul and I went to see you. Um, uh, I asked you many of the same questions that Bob Juvenville asked you today when I was with you. And I told you I didn't buy your story. Right? Sure. You know, and I still don't buy your story. I don't think it matters. I think it's more important what you've done. I, I don't think that's why we're here. I think we're here to decide if you earned a commutation. And I think you have. I made it very clear from day one after I met with you that I was going to vote in favor of a commutation. And I told you when we went in, when I went into the jail, the first thing I said to you is I could never bring myself to vote and send anybody back to jail for the rest of their life. You remember that? Okay, and I, I haven't changed. I can't imagine anybody sitting in this chair in front of me on a first degree murder who has done enough to get here where I would vote against them. You've done some great things. And, you, and as I said to your son earlier, he should be very proud of you, as, as your friends and, and family should be. You know, one of your witnesses made a comment that you know, a person is in here for what they did, not for who they are. And I think that 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 really spoke volumes. I think it, it said a lot and it says a lot about you. You know, you had one really horrible day in your life where something really horrible happened and you paid dearly. For it. Um, but I think you've paid enough. When this comes up on February 16th, I will be voting for your commutation. And I'm going to leave you with this thought as you go back to jail tonight, which is where you're going. You only need four votes in this council with the lieutenant governor to get a commutation. So I think the likelihood of you being your sentence and being commuted as you leave here tonight is pretty damn strong. And I think you should go back tonight and sleep well. Because I think that's what you, I know you had a long, tough day. We all did. We're not usually here this late. But um, I think you earned it. I think you are a, uh, a very decent, kind human being who's helped his fellow man in ways that not many people have. Uh, you earned it, and I'm going to vote. Thank you. I just want to say in conclusion, thank everybody, you know, for staying so long. Uh, Mr. Koontz and members of the council, like uh, we've indicated earlier, the vote will be on February 16th. And it's a tough vote. I mean, there's no question. 
you've had a remarkable, you have a remarkable record. You've done a great job while in the institution, incarcerated, it's no question. But at the same time, we have to think of the Santos family as well. It's not that easy. You're a relatively a young man, 50 some odd, I'm not sure exactly how old, but you're asking for us for freedom. They're not gonna have that for their son. Their son is gone forever. There's no freedom for their son, he's gone. Uh, it's a tough vote, uh, but again, you, uh, you've helped a lot of people uh, in prison. You're involved in those many, many programs, which you all appreciate. And again, thank you. And on February 16th, it's what, two or three weeks away, the council will take up uh, the vote on your commutation. Again, thank everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Okay.